Hi, we're Snooty. I'm Christer. And I'm Claire. And on this channel, we talk about game development and we're sharing our journey as we're going along. And today, we're talking about a tutorial. Oh yeah. Lately, Christer has been making a cool, neat little tune shader, which we're going to be sharing with you today. I might have been spending a bit too much time on it. Uh, this happened. Have you been playing too much Breath of the Wild? It, it, it has such beautiful shaders. Yeah, it does. One of our favourite things in Breath of the Wild is when the character is standing next to the torch. You can see the flickering on the character itself. And the light kind of wraps around the character. Yeah. So this shader is trying to capture a lot of those features. The shader that Krista has been working on sports actually a multiple light sources, allows adjustable shading bands. It also has a beautiful gloss and fresnel control, and it's unlit so it doesn't receive direct shadows, but can still fake being in the shadow. The setup is obviously very character centric, so the action happens on the character. Uh, this setup is probably not very ideal for tune shading an entire world, but utilizes a bit of a similar uh, system to Zelda Breath of the Wild. Want to jump to a specific part in this video? Then just check the timestamps in the description. Because we've been efficient and making timestamps. I put everything for this project up on GitHub. So if you see any mistakes or improvements we made to the setup, please fork it, make pull requests, open issues, so we can make this epic. Yeah. When I started working on this tutorial, I had no clue how big an undertaking it was going to be. I've been refining and remaking this uh, tune shader over and over again. But I think it's starting to get there now. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. It was probably good the first time around. Yeah, probably. It's better now. It's even better. Having a look at the final material of the shader, it looks quite daunting at first glance, but I promise it's not that bad. I, I tried to make it easy, but you know. Yeah. It's been tried and tested on me, so. Mm -hmm. The first two here are the usual color and texture that most materials have. The third one is quite interesting. It's a shading gradient, which uh, decides how many bands your twin shader is going to have and how light goes across it, and also how it falls over distance. We'll get back to this. It's pretty awesome. We've even made a gradient library to use with it. The next two is controlling the glossiness, size, and intensity, which is quite straightforward. The next three are the Fresnel control, where you can choose how far the light wraps around the object when it's backlit. So creating this beautiful rim light effect from any light source. Finally, we have a huge set of light inputs, up to six lights, and three inputs per light. A direction, color, and attenuation. But Christer, I see only two inputs. Well, for the color, we have RGBA, and we only actually need the RGB. So we were using the alpha channel to store the light's attenuation value. And attenuate what do you, I hear you say? Uh, we'll go to attenuation in a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, it's two inputs per light, but we have a third hidden input being passed in with a color alpha. Everything but the light and data is user configurable. Drag the sliders and have fun. To get the light and data populated, this setup uses a little tune helper script on the character to set all this light and data on the material itself. This script will look at all of the lights in the scene, raycast to see if the light is in sight, figure out the light direction, color, and the attenuation. <clears throat> so we mentioned light attenuation. Basically, that is how light intensity decreases over distance. As you get close to the light source, the attenuation value is closer to one, and the further away from the light source you are, it goes towards zero. Quite straightforward, I hear you say. But not so fast. It's not a linear falloff. The calculation is a so-called inverse square law. Um, yeah. More about that on Wikipedia? More about that on Wikipedia. <laughs> So we use the light attenuation value to figure out how dim the light is at the distance. That's pretty much all there is to this shader, but just keep in mind that each character needs its own material. Now, if you're here for the juicy parts of the video, I welcome you. Let's boot up a new Unity project. I'm rolling with UDRP, Universal Render Pipeline, previously known as the LVRP, the Lightweight Render Pipeline, using Unity 2020 Alpha, but it's also tested and fully works in Unity 2019. That's where I first built it. So yeah, we're setting up a new project with that. Once Unity is finished loading here, we just clean the scene up a little bit, deleting what's unnecessary and just keeping the bare minimum. And we will get started on building the shader. I'm going to be bringing in all the assets we have been using for this tutorial and put it in our Tune Shader folder. In here, we got our gradients, our Susan model and our Tune Helper script. Now let's just start by pulling Susan into the world. Oh, hi there, Susan, our little blender monkey. I will not be building the C Sharp Tune Helper script in this tutorial, otherwise you'll be here all day. But in simple terms, this script finds the directions of all the lights in the scene and their colors and their distances and just puts that information into the material so the shader can use it. 
the first thing we need to do to get going is to draw on our tune helper. Now you see this script here, it takes a material and there's some older settings there. We're not going to worry about that for, for now, but we're going to give it a material and we're going to make a new one. So I'm going to right click here and create first the shader, going to be an unlit graph. Then I right click the shader and create material. And I'm going to name the material after the monkey. This is because you need to have one material per character. And I'm going to throw this material onto Susan. And ta-da! We have a very flat monkey. Now we also need to remember to put this material onto our tune helper. Um, and that's actually the more important part. Now open up our tune shader. We have the blackboard and the main preview. I'm going to be turning the preview off because we actually want to look into the scene and see the proper thing. I'm going to give ourselves some more space to work in so we don't get so crammed out and we want to have these side by side so we can see a bit better what we're actually working on. Now let's start off with the interesting part of the shader right away. So for that we're going to need a vector tree. We're going to call this light one direction. I'm going to make a color light one color. And it's very important, we want to name these L1 underscore direction underscore L1 underscore color because our tune helper will be populating information into these parameters. And it's also important we keep them exposed. So otherwise, when Unity starts batching materials, it will uh, bleed the information between the shaders if you have multiple objects running around. So keep them uh, as is. Now let's hit save on that. So I'll have a little look at what we got here. We have the direction, which is a vector three, and that tells you which point the light comes from in the scene onto this specific mesh. And then we also have the color, which is a representation of uh, how bright and what color that light is in this location. For now, I'll close the blackboard so we have some more space to work with, and we can include the normal vector of the model. If you now do the dot product between these, now it doesn't matter which order you plug these and put this into the color, we will see we no longer have a flat monkey. It's important to note here that the values which are bright, they're pointing towards the light source and the values which are dark are pointing away. Well, actually they go below black because white is one, this is zero, and here it goes into minus one where it points away from the light source. So you have the whole specter of uh, information all around here. It doesn't stop where it turns black. It's just we can't see blacker than black the way it's currently set up. To explain the dot product very quickly, it's a function which takes two vectors and its output is a value between minus one to one. If the vectors point in the same direction, the value is one. And if they're pointing 180 degrees away from each other, the value is minus one, where at 90 degrees apart, they would be zero. If you want a more in-depth description about dot products, be sure to check out Freya Holmer's video on it. Right, so given ourselves a little bit more space, so we're going to be building more stuff. Now, if we open the blackboard, we can add in a texture 2D shading gradient. We can give it a default of gradient E2, um, but we also need to remember when we save this now to also put the texture onto here. Otherwise, we're going to not be seeing anything. Uh, the defaults don't always hook up. So let's have a look at what this actually looks like. We will take a texture sampler and we will hook this straight into the color. We can close up the blackboard and hit save. And there we go. Now we can just basically see that we have applied this texture straight to the monkey face and it looks very strange. Um, freaky monkey. But that's not what we want here really. We want to use the UVs of the texture area to specify where the light is and isn't where we're going to have the x-axis, uh, which is 0 to 1 in uh, this direction, will represent how much we're pointing towards the light using the dot product. The y-axis we will use as the distance from the light with the light attenuation. To get our working, we're going to take or make our own UVs, vector 2. I'm going to set the y-uv to 0.5 for now. So we are somewhere up on the texture. And the x-axis we want to remap of the, the dot product. So we hook this in input. We know the dot product goes from minus one to one and the UV space goes from zero to one. So this is looking quite good, but we want to make one minor adjustment here to just move up a little bit by 0.1 and 0.99. As UVs wrap around, you'll get some weird artifacts going on unless you clamp it in just a little bit. And there we go. We now basically have the first fruits of our labor. If we grab the direction of light, we can see that if we turn it around, it updates. This is obviously because we're feeding in light data into the shader. Now there's one more thing we want to do, and that is hook up the light attenuation. 
And we, from the light color, have the alpha channel, which is not being used. So we're going to split this out. And this tune helper gives us the light's RGB values, but the alpha value is the attenuation. So we can hook the attenuation value straight up into the Y, and this will then be the distance from the light where it moves up and down this gradient we set earlier. The UV space we're working with here looks a bit like this, where the X value is the surface direction towards the light, and the Y value is the character's distance from the light. Moving the white area towards the left, the light will wrap more around the mesh. How slanted the gradient is will change this effect depending on the distance from the light. This way we can create some really interesting effects with how the light behaves by changing the input gradient. For example, we can even experiment with different colors or gradients over distance. For directional light, the attenuation value is always at 1. If we turn directional light off and instead create a point light, with our point light we can see that if we move far away, the shading on the monkey gets smaller, and as we move closer, it completely envelops him. And this is because we have a slanting on our gradient where it moves from more light and less light. So the distance uh, will actually affect how much of the mesh is being covered. But as you can see, when we move this far away, this is not quite working yet. Also at the moment, we're not caring much about the light's color. So whatever we set this to, it doesn't have an effect. So let's get that part working, shall we? Let's go with a pink monkey. Now let's tidy up our graph a little bit. I'm going to take all these nodes and press Ctrl G and call it Shade. So this will be the basis of our shading. Uh, next we want to add in the light's color and ambient lighting, etc. So we can take the, the light color node from our blackboard and we can multiply it with the output of this. And then we should be able to now see the color. Right, that turned completely black. Let's try to increase the intensity of our light bit. Yes, there we are. We now have a pink monkey that is working properly. Looks to me like Susan is ready to go to the party. Let's tidy this up a bit. Next, we should add in some texture and ambient like most textures has. Uh, so let's go with uh, color, which we're just going to call color and it can be defaulted to white. Then also to create a texture 2D which we're just going to call Text 2D. I'm going to move this to the top. Uh, they don't need any more special setup than that. So here we have the color and the texture. We'll do the same here. Sample the texture. I'll close this up. And we will want to multiply the color with the texture. This is a very common way of setting things up. Um, multiply these two again in with the output. Uh, if we turn the, the light back to a more normal color, we can now set color and texture on the material, which is very common. Uh, so you can, you know, make a red monkey without having a red light, which is a normal approach. And you can also, of course, apply a texture to your monkey. I'm not going to use these two for now, but they are here and we're going to wrap them up and call them texture. And we made some more space here for some ambient. So we see that it's completely black here. We want to raise that a little bit to the natural color of the world. So we're going to add the ambient onto the end here and plug that back into the color. This will be our final step. If we hit save now, we will see that the blacks are no longer completely black. We have a little bit of gray or whichever the ambient color you have chosen for your scene, which you can configure in the lighting tab uh, and how that works. You might also want to use the, the baked GI node instead of the ambient or combine them together. Um, but in this scenario, I think that gets a bit extreme. It depends really how the scene is set up, which one of these is relevant for you to use. Um, but I'm going to just go with the basic um, ambient node here. So at this point, this is what the shader looks like. You can basically use it like this. Uh, it only supports one light. We'll be doing that at the very end and adding more light support. And we're basically just maxing this section together over and over. But before that, we're going to be making a Fresnel and a gloss effect. Cut, 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 cut. Present day, Christer. What? To pass, Christer. Yes. Stop right there. Yeah, I was enjoying this tutorial. Yeah, I, I know, I know, I know. You, you might have been enjoying this tutorial, but I mean, this last nine minutes, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 that was like an hour worth of footage. You have a very good point, Claire. Uh, also, I think the most important aspect of this shader has already been covered, and that is kind of how we're using this shading gradient to both influence the distance from the light with the light attenuation and how we can use multiple shading bands. <sighs> so you got the most important part done. Yeah. Thank you for watching. We hope you found this interesting or valuable, and maybe you'll go off and make a Zelda-like tune shader for yourself. We were considering to use this shader in Mr. Pips. Talking about Mr. Pips, they'll be coming out the devlog in about two weeks' time, 
and there's been lots of action. We even had a mush bit going on on the stream a little while ago, and uh, yeah, we'll see how that's going. Yeah, plenty of blueberries rocking it out. <laughs> yes. Now remember to hit that like and subscribe, smash it if you like, and if you have any feedback or comments, let us know in down below, and we will have a look and. Maybe you have some good ideas on how we can make this better. If so, remember, everything is open on GitHub and you're welcome to fork it if you like. Hope you guys all have an amazing week. And until then, so Bye-bye.